Acts 8 and verse 12. Romans 8 and verse 12. That's where we're going to begin. And I had told you that we would get down through verse 30, but I went back and looked over my notes. We're going to actually get down through verse 25. And so we'll jump into verse 26 and following on Wednesday night. <clears throat> so today be verses 12 through 25. And before we jump into that, let's, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you give to us. We thank you for an opportunity to study your word this morning. We thank you for the book of Romans, a book that carries such a, a heavy punch, a book that offers so much comfort and reassurance that what you're striving for from your creation is loyalty, devotion, and true allegiance. We pray that you'd help us to reflect upon these great eternal truths, that we might be the faithful servants of yours in this world. Please be with our shepherds as they watch over us. Please be with us in our efforts to better apply your word. Continue to watch over us as we strive to share your gospel with the world around us. We love you, Lord, and pray you'll be exalted in this this morning and be with us in our worship after that. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Romans 8, <clears throat> verse 12. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to make, make one point. In verses 1 through 11, at the end of class on last Sunday, we talked just for a minute about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, and I want to just briefly make one point of clarification, because I don't think I spent enough time on it there, there at the very end of class. <clears throat> While I offered the possibility that there could be a, a literal indwelling of some sort, uh, I did stress, may, you may remember, I did stress the fact that that would not manifest itself like the world around us says it manifests itself. You know, the tingling, the moving, my gut rumbling, the personal revelations from God, none of that happens. You don't see that in the book, and so it's not going to happen today. But at the very end of class, I stressed, and I hope I got it across, while I could acknowledge that's a possibility, I don't think that's what the Bible teaches anywhere, Okay. I don't think when you see God dwelling in the Christian, the Spirit in the Christian, Christ in the Christian, the Father in Christians, I don't think that's about geography. I don't think that's about a literal God being inside me sort of thing. I think it's about harmony. I think it's about being in a right relationship with God. Uh, much like, we use this all the time, I could say right now, my Father lives in me. And you understand what I mean, don't you? I don't mean my father, who is six foot two and 350 pounds, is inside of me because he's actually still alive and in Oklahoma. But, but I do mean that I am a representative of my father. I live out in a lot of ways a lot of the goofy mannerisms of my own dad. Um, so I use that illustration to hopefully make the point. We see it in the text. Let's not get mystical and magical. Let, let, let's think more about about what he's talking about, relational, relational, okay? You got questions on that, we could, well, you could spend a whole quarter nearly on that subject, and I summed it up in four minutes. So, let's jump in, this is verse 12, because some of that plays into this text as well, okay? So verse 12, down through verse 25. Romans 8, verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who had subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. 
And not only they, but ourselves also, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. All right. I think a few questions in the booklet deal with this section. I think there's three. Question number four. Question number four. What obligations do children of God have? To live in the Spirit. To live in the Spirit. To live in the Spirit, absolutely. Now, now this is maybe more of a thought-reflective question. Why do they have it? Why is that the obligation of the children of God? To live in the Spirit. That's it. That's it. We owe that because that's what's been done for us. All, of, all that's been done <clears throat> for us. Question number five. What does Paul say is incomparable? The suffering versus the glory we shall receive? Absolutely. Man, I'll tell you what, guys. Verse 18 ought to be a highlight verse. If you're a highlighter, that's a verse to highlight. Okay, and we'll talk more about that when we get to it. Question number six. For what are we eagerly waiting? Verse 23. Redemption. Redemption. Does anybody have any questions on that section that we didn't cover? Okay. All right, verse 12. Verse 12. R remember, simple interpreting of the Bible... Therefore, means he's continuing the discussion. This is somewhat conclusive remarks. He's tying in some conclusive statements to what he's just elaborated on in his point. But these are connected topics. He's not shifting gears, not switching horses. Same stuff. Verse 12, therefore, brethren. Some translations use brothers and sisters. That's the idea. It's one Greek word, and yet it carries that familial concept. Now, you think about that. We've observed this point several times. Paul, a lot of cases, will choose very familial terms when he's about to say something very challenging. I like that. Pay attention to that. He, he's affixing to challenge his readers, but before he does, he, he draws them in. It's like, it's like when I say folks. I say brethren. You know, some preachers, I used to know, um, you guys would know Artie Brown. Artie Brown used to say Beloved. When I was about five, that was the weirdest thing in the world to hear in the pulpit. Listen, beloved. I thought, nobody says that. Quit, stop, quit Mr. Brown. Uh, no, I did not tell Mr. Brown that. I left that alone. But, but you know what I'm talking about? It, it, it draws you in. Hey, the, I'm fixing to challenge you. But I'm drawing you in. I want you to hear what I have to say. I want, you to, I want you to follow the conclusions I'm making. But you need to make sure and think about this. And that's exactly what Paul's doing here. Therefore, brethren, we are under obligation New American Standard. We are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So our obligation, our duty, is not to the flesh. Now let's think about this in the context of Romans. What has the flesh done for us? Nothing. It has brought pain, it has brought suffering, it has brought death, all because of sin and the flesh's disposition towards sin. That's why we're not under obligation to it, because we've been saved from it. Now, it's kind of a fascination. If you're reading through this, you would anticipate him to say, verse 12, we're, we're debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. You'd almost expect him to say, but we are debtors to the Spirit, to live according to the Spirit. But he doesn't say that here. It's almost like he gets so excited, he moves on to the next verse. He moves on to the next point. And in that next point, he's going to elaborate on that, but he doesn't come out and say it. It is implied. So if we're not under obligation to the flesh, we're not under this debtor, uh, or not debtors to the flesh, then who are we debtors to? The Spirit. We're under obligation to the Spirit, to live according to the Spirit. Now here's why, verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You see why he brings it up here in the way he does? 
So you're not debtors to the flesh. You're not supposed to be living according to the flesh. And if you're thinking, well, I don't really see the, the significance of this, Paul. I don't really see why this is such an important ordeal, Paul. He goes right into verse 13 and tells you exactly why this is so critical. Because if you do live that way, if you act as a debtor to the flesh and you live according to the flesh, where it will get you every time is death. Man, you got to see this. <clears throat> this is why he says, brethren, in verse 12. Because in verse 13, he says, you're going to die if you live that way. That's not a popular position in any culture. And yet it is a fundamental truth. It is a reality of Christianity. You live according to the world, you're going to die with the world. And, and yet implied in that, and what he's going to kind of elaborate on in just a second is you don't have to live that way. That's exactly why you're an ob uh, obligated to the Spirit. It's exactly why you're a debtor to the Spirit because He has saved you, God has saved you from living in the flesh and dying in the flesh. And so he says in verse 13, but if you through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. See what he does? Here, here are two options. Well, we like that, don't we? Two options. Live this way, you die. But if you'll live this way, you'll live. You'll live. We've noticed this a lot through Romans, especially chapter 8. The word spirit here, not capitalized in the Greek. Okay? So you've got to kind of use a little bit of context clues to determine which spirit he's talking about. Could be the Holy Spirit of God. Could be the spirit of man. If it's the spirit of man, then it's talking about our attitudes, our dispositions, our mannerisms, those sorts of things. Now, observe this, though. There are times, even in Romans 8, we're going to see this in just a second. There are times where I, I don't necessarily think we have to make a big distinction. Because there's sometimes a sense in which it's a little bit of both. Our disposition, our attitude changes because of what the Holy Spirit has done. Everybody follow that? We're going to see that in just a few verses. It happens here in the text we just read. Okay, so we'll see that in just a second. Sam, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 No, notice something. Sam is exactly right. Paul is is really elaborating on some of the same points. Now we're going to see that actually in just a few verses. In verse sixteen, we'll elaborate more on this to a degree. But, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a teaser now. All of these are the same descriptions. There, there's not, diff, I mean, sometimes it's expressing a different facet of a relationship with God. And yet at the same time, it's really all just saying the same thing. Being led by the Spirit, it's the same as being dwelled, uh, indwelled by the Spirit. It's not magical. It's not, I mean, the Spirit's not got a rope around my belly and just kind of tugging me towards things. But when I follow the teachings revealed by God's Holy Spirit... I'm being led by the Spirit. I'm following the proddings of the Spirit. Okay? Galatians 5 fits in here a little bit. We're, follow, we're being led by the Spirit of God. We're not doing the works of the flesh. We're pursuing the things, the fruit of the Spirit. It's exactly what we're talking about. Okay? And so when you work through this text here in Romans 8, it's the same stuff. Different sides of the same discussion. Okay? All right. No, notice this. He says, if you, through the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So, through a shift in mentality, through a shift in our person, living spiritually, if we'll put to death those things, then we can live. Uh, King James Version uses the phrase, mortify the deeds of the body. I kind of like that, mortify. I don't think we use that word very much in our culture today. But it does bring to mind, it brings to mind some, some, some almost graphic language. 
That's kind of what he's saying here. You put to death. Even in the New King James, you put to death. Deeds, deeds is a neutral term. Deeds can be good, deeds can be bad. Obviously, in the context of what we're talking about here, what kind of deeds are these? Oh, that was a question. Come on. What kind of deeds are these? Bad ones. Bad ones. Bad ones. So he's saying, here's things that would essentially distract you from living spiritually, walking according to the Spirit, things that would destroy that walk with Christ. He says, you're killing those things. Things that distract you from serving God. You're killing them. Fact is, if you don't kill them, they'll kill you. Okay, this is a bloody war. We need to make sure we appreciate that. Go ahead. Yeah. Ritualistic things you had to do, and he's trying to contrast yeah. against that. Yeah. That that's no longer what you're focused on. Yeah. You're focused on the part of the Bible. Yeah. Your, your loyalty and devotion to God. Your loyalty and devotion to God. We're relying on what he has done for us and our being faithful to him. Okay? Go ahead, Larry. I know. I can see it. Go ahead. Yeah. That could be a I'm not going to argue that it could not be a, an end I'm not Yeah, to yeah. You, you and I have talked about that. To me, it seems that the disposition that Christ had, let this mind be in you, as it is in yeah. too. Yeah. It seems to me that that's what seems to flow here because that way we can put to death those things. We don't even think about these deeds of yeah. the body anymore because we're thinking about like Christ, like Christ. Like Christ. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a sense, Philippians 2, verse 5 and following, that he referred to. There's a sense in which that's almost synonymous with what's being done here, okay? Um, and, and that's why I said a moment ago, there's a sense in which I, we don't necessarily have to say, well, this is the Holy Spirit of God versus this is the spirit or attitude or disposition which we should have. There's a sense in which they're, 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 they're kind of working together. You get to verse 16, that's absolutely what he's going to come out and say. There's a sense in which they're, they're kind of, they're not a struggle between, oh, which one should it be in this verse, which one should it be in that verse. There's a sense in which they complement one another. Our attitude, our disposition, our spirit is modified, is corrected, is instructed by God's Holy Spirit, okay? Helps us have that attitude of Christ, the spirit of Christ, and so forth. And so, yeah, we could talk, we could talk more about that if you have questions. But notice again, we'll live if we do this. Death is the inevitable outcome if you don't, but life is offered by the grace of God and life that can be attained. So verse 14. <clears throat> For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 14, even though it says of God here, you could still read how this could be a spiritual disposition. Because this would be the disposition that God wants from you. Okay, just as easily read that. Although I think this is probably a pretty good indicator, at least right here, we're looking at the Holy Spirit of God. We're being led by God's will. Sounds like a good thing, right? Okay, it's not mystical or magical, but we're being directed by God's will. That's what we're looking at. Again, plug in Galatians 5 here. We're not doing the works of the flesh anymore. We're living and carrying the fruit of the Spirit now. Same exact concept. Same exact concept as what we're looking at here. But notice, <coughs> these individuals, led by the Spirit of God, are sons of God. Um, we can do the gender-inclusive uh, version if you prefer. We are sons and daughters of God. The point's children. Children. But remember, remember the significance. In the first century Jewish Roman culture, who got all of dad's money? when he died? Well, who got 90% of it? I mean, who got the, the, the lion's share of the inheritance? The firstborn, but the firstborn what? Son. 
Okay? That stuff matters when you get to a few verses later. This is part of the reason why Paul's shifting his terminology. He uses a particular term in the Greek to reflect this shift. Okay? Earlier, he's using the term that would indicate sons. Okay? A specific term that indicates sons. Now, New King James doesn't reflect this very well in verse 14. A little broader. While it's making it broader, it's still reclusive. It's still only for those who are actually being led by the Spirit. So I want us to appreciate that there's a sense in which you you get spots like this. There's a limited aspect to this. And at the same time, a totally inclusive aspect of this. Let me explain that because I think this is awesome and super important. So it is limited in that this blessing is only to those who are being led by the Spirit. Only to those who are actually children of God. And then it is inclusive in the fact that if that's a title that describes you, you have as much right to it as anybody does. You think that matters? You think that matters in a first century world? We are not near as socially divided as the first century world was, folks. Okay, generally speaking, we look at a person, no matter their background, no matter their racial, no matter their, their, their money, and we recognize that person matters. First century world, is that the case? Mm-mm. Master have as, much, uh, have as much respect as a slave does? Mm-mm. You understand how revolutionary Galatians 3 is then? That in Christ there's neither slave nor free? There's either Jew nor Greek. There's neither male nor female. I think I'm preaching on something about that tonight. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get off of that for now. But, but, but again, just see how it fits in right here. And then you guys tonight, when I go, hey guys, here's some of the point I'm making in my lesson. You're going to go, Romans 8. Don't say it out loud though. It might distract me. But again, folks, here it is. Same description. Those who are led by the Spirit, those who are children of God, have as much right as children of God, as any other child of God. Sam, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we'll continue to follow the words of the Spirit, continue to follow this spiritual lifestyle, we can be assured. Folks, that's what Romans 8, in some respects, is about the assurance we have as God's children. Okay? Now, notice again that the, the shift in terminology is very important because as children now, we have something that people who are not children of God do not have. <coughs> so, verse 15. He says, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So some of that stuff he's pulling back up again from chapter 6, really even chapter 5 and chapter 6. There was a sense, there was a time where, where we were in slavery. But what God did was adopt us out of bondage, adopt us out of that, that predicament, and when we were adopted out of that, never again do we fear. So, uh, again, one of the rights of sonship, being children of God, is we don't have to fear. Think that's a matter uh, of significance? Yeah, go read 1 Thessalonians 4. Go read, go read Hebrews 2. We don't fear death like the rest of the world, do we? Well, that's one of the blessings of being God's children. We have a right to call him father. Here he says in verse 15, you've received the spirit of adoption. Boy, that's a tough, it's a tough phrase. It's a tough phrase to, to translate. And there's some discussion about how it should be translated, okay? Um, but, but essentially, I, I think for the most part, the easiest way to, to look at it is this attitude. Again, it mine's capitalized, probably shouldn't be. But this attitude or disposition of an adopted child, okay? That's kind of the idea. So it's by that, by our adoptive status, we cry out. 
The, the term cry out here, sometimes people look at this as like it's a, um, a, you know, like a, a shriek, and that's not the case. It is a petition. It is a petition. And notice the particular petition Paul says. Abba, Father. Abba is Aramaic for Father. Father, um, I don't think needs a translation. Um, it's Father. <laughs> that was supposed to be a joke. Okay, come on. So, so notice, though. Abba, Father. Does anybody know a significant time when that phrase is used elsewhere? Anybody? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. In fact, it's one of the only places you find this phrase used. Abba, Father. Now, folks, what's significant about that? Jesus is the unique Son of God. Jesus is called the firstborn of God. Now, that's not necessarily that God created him. We know that. But it is the rights as his unique Son. Now, think about what I said a moment ago. Who gets all the inheritance from the Father in the first century world? The firstborn Son. Jesus is the unique Son of God. John 1, verse 12 and 13 says that through Him, He gave us the right to become children of God. That's what we're talking about here. Through Jesus, we have the right to become children of God, and then we are given the same status of privilege that He had. We get to use the same terms He used. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark 14, verse 36. Abba, Father. Same terms he gets to use for God, we get to use for God. Now that's part of this inheritance we're going to get because he's going to go right into, in just a second, this being heirs business. We are full children of God with every right to call him our Father, with every right to an inheritance. Okay? So we get to call him Abba, Father. Now, we're familiar with some of these concepts. They're huge in the New Testament. Um, Ephesians talks a lot about our inheritance among the saints. Uh, 1 Peter 1, verses 1 through 9 talks a lot about this. This inheritance that we have that is incorruptible and undefiled is reserved in heaven for you. Folks, this is a huge matter in the New Testament faith. Okay? So he says, verse, verse 16 then. The Holy Spirit himself, verse 16. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So you've got two spirits in this verse. One of them has got to be the Holy Spirit, just based on the, the, the way that the text is laid out. The other spirit is ourself. And, and so you've got this working in cooperation with one another, this in unison with one another, as we are adapting our life to the Spirit's life, adapting the way we live to the way the Spirit tells us to live. Uh, I've mean, I got a quote here from Albert Barnes. This is a really good quote. He says, the Holy Spirit furnishes the evidence to our minds that we are adopted into the family of God. He says, this effect is not unfrequently, I love that, I, that's not a word, but it should be, unfrequently attributed to the Holy Spirit. See, I'm not the only guy who makes up words, okay? He says, if it is to be asked how this is done, I answer. It is not by any revelation of new truth. It is not by inspiration. It is not always by assurance. It is not by a mere persuasion that we are elected to eternal life, but it is by producing in us the appropriate effects of his influence. It is to renew the heart, to sanctify the soul, to produce the fruit of the Spirit. If a man has these, he has evidence of the witnessing of the Spirit with his spirit. I like that. I completely agree with it. Okay? It is applying the words of God's Holy Spirit, living out the fruit of the Spirit, and when we do that, we have this cooperation between the Holy Spirit of God and our spirit. And it is a, itself a witness to the fact that we are children of God, we have been adopted into the family, and we have an equal right to the heirship, the inheritance. Okay? Uh, questions on any of that? Phyllis? <coughs> the, the mixed audience in Rome. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's part of the same discussion. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. So, so let's, let's discuss that a little bit. 
He's saying you're the sons of God. He's saying you're the heirs of the inheritance. In the Jewish mind, that would immediately connect them to the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? Remember that being a big deal in the New Testament? John 8, we are the children of Abraham. That's a big deal to a Jew, guys. When they're a Jew and they're a son of Abraham, that means they have a right to the Abrahamic promises of God. Okay? What Paul's saying here is, exactly to Phyllis's point, you're all heirs to God. We're going to see that in verse 17. Folks, that means Jews and Gentiles. That is going to beg the question in the Jewish reader, the Jewish Christian reader. Wait a minute, Paul. If Gentiles and Jews are heirs to the, to the riches of God, what about the original sons of God? That's where we get chapters 9 through 11, guys. Chapters 9 through 11, Paul's going to discuss how old Israel fits into this new paradigm of the new covenant people, okay? And so that, that's the question that they're begging now, okay? And that's why chapter 9 gets to that, okay? So I'm glad you brought that up. All right, verse 17 then. So if children of God, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Notice again, so if children... Make, make sure you see that. that. That is there in the Greek text. If children, then you are heirs and heirs of God at that. So the qualifier is if you are children of God. Now another way to say that then is if you're walking in the Spirit, if you're being led by the Spirit, it's all the same stuff. If you're children of God, then you are an heir to the riches of God, being an heir to God himself. So again... We, we can see some of that flavors. Old Israel was the heirs of God. They were the sons of God. Uh, and that phrase is used of the kings of Israel a couple of times too. Psalm 2, though it's messianic, prophetic towards Jesus, it was about the original kings of Israel, kings of, of Judah. They were the sons of God. And so here it is. The true sons of God are those who are being led by the Spirit, who are walking in the Spirit, who are living in the Spirit, because this is the Spirit age, Right? Notice what he says, though. He doesn't just leave it at that. You've got to see this. He doesn't just leave it at that. He says, you're joint heirs with Christ. You get the significance of that? Jesus has the right to the inheritance. Jesus doesn't have to share the inheritance. And yet Jesus does share the inheritance. He gives us a right to become children of God and then shares the riches of the Father with us. We become joint heirs in that sense. And so he says... If indeed we suffer with him. Notice again the if, qualified here. If indeed we suffer with him, we will be glorified with him. So uh, again, there is qualifiers here. You're only a child of God. You're only an heir to God's riches. You're only being led by the Spirit if you're willing to suffer with Jesus. If you're willing to, to put in this life, to be this person. Okay? You don't get that. You don't get that if you quit. And you don't get that if you're unwilling to do these things. Very relevant in the first century, though, guys, especially in Rome. Because we talked about this. This is written before the Roman persecution of Christianity, before Paul died, <laughs> obviously. Come on, come on. So before Paul died, Paul's going to die, though, in a few years. Peter's going to die in a few years. You think the concept of suffering is a pretty big deal to the New Testament Christian? Absolutely. They need to be ready for it. If indeed you suffer with him, then you will be glorified with him. Big motif of the New Testament Christian. Suffer to inherit glory. Suffer to inherit glory. 1 Peter addresses that. In fact, it's one of the predominant themes in 1 Peter. Suffer to inherit glory. Jesus suffered to inherit glory. We should follow his example. That's 1 Peter 3, 18 through chapter 4 and verse 2. Be ready. Be ready. We might have what he offers to us. Let's move along here. We've got a few verses to cover still. <coughs> Verse 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. So he brings up the, possibi or the, the reality of glorification in verse 17 and then immediately goes into, okay, I just talked about suffering, just talked about glory, so let's consider that for a moment. The glory that will be revealed in us can't even be compared with what we are enduring now in our suffering. There is no comparison, folks. The idea, the idea is that the old balancing scales. You put suffering on one end and glory on the other, and it falls through the table. <laughs> 
There's no real comparison. I mean, that, that's the idea. The glory so outweighs the suffering that the scales can't even re represent it truthfully. That's exactly what he's talking about here. The word revealed is kind of important in this text. And through verse 25, you're going to see it repeated a lot. It is the same word as revelation. Remember us talking about that a little bit? Revelation means to reveal something. Okay? It doesn't mean apocalyptic end of the world. That's not the way that's used in the first century. That's not that word. But it is a revelation, a revealing of something that was unseen. And so he says in verse 18, the glory which will be unveiled in us. The curtain pulled back when we actually see what we are getting. The heir of God. The inheritance that Christ shares. What it really and truly means to be children of God. When we see that, all the suffering in the world will be as nothing. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul talks about this as well. Okay? Man, I'd love to talk more on that, but we, we can't. Verse 19. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Lots of discussion here about what creation is. And, and you've got scholars that kind of fall on both sides of the discussion. I think, I think for the most part that what Paul is doing is using personification. We can talk about it later. Uh, personification in the created order of things. Even the material universe... Okay, let's think about it like this. The material universe was created, was created so that we could become children of God. And so in a personified sense, even the created order is eagerly waiting for that which it was created for. Okay, and he's going to use this a couple more times in this text, down into verse 22 actually. And then verse 23, he's going to shift it a little bit. So, so notice this, there's this earnest expectation. It is eagerly waiting Pay attention when he does that, okay? Stressing this, he says, essentially says eager twice in the text, okay? Earnest expectation, and then eagerly, he's repeating concepts here. Lots of hope looking forward. Lots of excitement anticipating what will be. Waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. When the sons of God are finally, completely, and fully revealed, manifested as it should be, that's what everybody's looking forward to. Now, the only thing this would exclude then, creation here, uh, probably, the, like I said a minute ago, the inanimate, the anything other than human, okay, the created natural order of things, this would exclude unbelievers because unbelievers are not anxiously awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. They're not privy to that. It would uh, exclude angelic beings who are not suffering decay, as he says in verse 21. This is the created world. Okay? Material universe. Verse 20 and following. For the creation was subjected to futility. That's kind of wastefulness. Just subjected to futility. Not willingly, but because of him who has subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. <coughs> so notice it says, creation was subjected to wastefulness. The world was created for us to have a relationship with God. When sin entered the world, decay entered the world. Death entered the world. And things were no longer what they should have been. Right? Everybody follow that? Now, even the world itself, Paul is saying, is looking forward to the day when all things will be as they should be. Even the created world longs for that period of time. If I can say time accommodatively. <laughs> Looks forward to eternity. Now... It was subjected to this futility, not willingly. God, in judicial action, subjected the world to this futility. But he did it because there is the future hope. It's exactly what he says in verse 21. That hope of the creation itself being delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. I'll throw this out. We don't have time to discuss it. There is some who take this here as a kind of new heavens and new earth sort of thing. Um, and I, I, I really only mention it and have no time to say yay or nay in any capacity, okay? But I don't think that's what he's talking about here, all right? I think he is using personification to elaborate the depth of hope which we all are looking forward to the reunion with God. Now, notice he says, the day creation itself 
will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Corruption has plagued all of the created order, so much so that even the creation looks forward to the, rele- to the relief it expects in, in the revealing of the sons of God. Verse 22, this goes right in with it. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Paul is precise in his words. He doesn't simply say that the world is suffering. It says groaning and suffering. The word he uses is translated as labors with birth pangs. It's one word in Greek. One word in Greek, but it translates to labors with birth pangs. There are precise words for these things. If he wants to just say suffering generically, he could have said suffering generically. He, yet, he said that word in verse 18, okay? <laughs> but he uses a word that is pregnant. <clears throat> That's a great pun right there. <clears throat> that was a great one. He uses a pregnant word, though, because it's a particular kind of pain. A pain that ends with hope, right? That's what labor pains are. Horrible, painful, traumatic, but what happens at the end of those labor pains? A little bouncing bumble of joy, or a monster, whichever. But you see why he uses the word he uses? That's what creation's doing right now. It's groaning in anticipation of the end of the labor pains, which is the whole reason it's here, when everything is as it should be. Now notice then he says in verse 23, not only they, that's not a good translation there. Uh, Really, it's not only that. Not only that, but ourselves also, we have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. Paul Paul says, uh, the first line He's, it's kind of like uh, the old buyer commercials. And not only that, that's kind of what he does here. That's not all we're talking about, guys. It's not just the personification of creation that longs for this day. We're longing for this day. We're in anticipation of this day. Three times he says, we ourselves. Verse 23, ourselves also, even we ourselves grown within ourselves. I think that's why he's talking about this contrast, the created natural order of things in contrast with the sons of God, the children of God. He says, we're doing the same thing. We're groaning within ourselves. We're laboring in those birth pangs. But what we're looking forward to is the end of it all, where we finally get relief from this pain. We finally get relief from this pressure. And what we have at the end of it is the redemption of our bodies. And so he says, the the adoption that is the redemption of our bodies. We've made this point a couple of times. I want to make it again. Lots of places where God, through one of the apostles, says, um, we have it now, but we also don't have it yet. It's a now and yet figure of speech. And so he says this a lot with a lot of concepts. We're sanctified. Okay, there's a sense in which, yes, we're currently sanctified, but we have yet to experience full sanctification. Okay, says it here. Just before this, he said, we're adopted, didn't he? And now he's saying, we're, we're looking forward to the adoption. Well, what is it, Paul? Is it, we're, are we adopted or are we looking forward to adoption? Yes and yes. Currently, we're adopted as children of God. We're adopted by, by God at the point of our birth. Our baptism, oh yeah. But we're also looking forward to the full realization of what that adoption even means, guys. We're looking forward to being fully in the presence of the Father. I've not been in the presence of the Father yet. I've been adopted by the Father, and I know the Father loves me, and he's done that through through the older son, if I'm using that accommodative again. And yet, at the same time, I'm looking forward to the day when I'm in the Father's presence, when I'm brought into the banquet feast and set beside him in a place of honor. I'm ready to be fully adopted. And at the same time, I'm already adopted. Okay? Same concept with the redemption. We've been redeemed, bought out of slavery. Didn't he say that in chapter 6? Like 14 times? And at the same time, we're waiting for the full redemption of our body, where things are as they should be. We're getting a foretaste of the glory to come, here and now. And yet I'm ready for the real thing when we get there. We talk about that with worship sometimes, right? Worship is a glimpse at what heaven will be like. Here we are, surrounding God in praise as brothers and sisters of Christ. Aren't you ready to get there and do the real thing? I am. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, if you want to consider what that glory is, look at what Jesus said in John 17. 
Yeah. What he longed for was to be restored to the glory he had before. That's it. And that's that's it. the reason he went through what he went through yeah. on that cross so that he could be back where he was. That glory was so great in his mind yeah. that it ought to be great in our mind. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. John 17 is a great, great section of Scripture to plug in here. He was looking forward to the glory that he had before he came to the earth. Now, I'm going I'm to wrap this up very quickly. Verse 24. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, then we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So again, there's almost this paradox. Verse 24, we're saved in this hope. Wait a minute. If we're hoping, how does he write about it in past tense? We have been saved in this hope. Folks, that's a paradox. That verse makes no sense whatsoever unless we understand what I said a moment ago. We have it now, but we're also waiting for the full thing. We hope now because we know we are saved and we're looking forward to the full, real, total thing. And so he says, essentially, the the logic behind that is if we're hoping for what we already have, it's not hope, right? (laughs) If I'm hoping for it to rain, but it's already raining, I'm a moron, okay? (laughs) That's not how this works. The logic has got to be consistent. And so we're looking forward We're hoping for what is to come. Hebrews 11 maybe fits in here a little bit too, okay? Hebrews 11, verses 1 through 6. (coughs) And then verse 25, because of this, we hope for what we do not see. Remember that not seeing stuff? Same concept as what's being revealed. There is this constant parallel between what is seen and what is not seen. What is seen and what is not seen. The Christian that's being led by God, led by the Spirit of God, that is a child of God, that has the inheritance is willing to see and live his life on what is not seen. But we live in anticipation of what it will be like, what will be fully revealed when we see him as he is and behold him for who he is, okay? That's what motivates us and that's what allows us to eagerly wait, to long for in anticipation and then fight through it with perseverance, okay? It's going to be hard stuff. But what motivates us is seeing him for who he is. Appreciate your attention. We'll finish up that chapter in class on Wednesday night.